Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, the nuclear factor of activated T cells and the nuclear factor kappa B. Okay, so we're having a bit of a discussion about efficacy in pharmacology. Uh, so, uh, basically, what we are discussing is if you've got a certain amount of calcium ions to release within a cell, and um, you can choose how to release them, basically. I, you, could all release, you could release them all in one go, and you'll get a certain amount of effect from those um, calcium uh, ions. I, you'll get a certain amount of, at the moment we're discussing, NFAT activity. Uh, but is that the most optimal way? Will you get the most, active, most activity from NFAT that you could have got? Well, the answer is no. And the reason is that there is a certain number of NFAT molecules in the cytoplasm. Now, at some calcium concentration in the cytoplasm, you will activate enough calcineurin that it can effectively activate all of these NFAT molecules. So, at some calcium concentration, you will effectively get the maximum effect that you could ever possibly get. So, let's say that calcium concentration was here. Then, if you raise calcium even further, it's not going to increase the effect of NFAT any more beyond what it would have been if you'd just gone to that height there. Okay, so you've effectively wasted loads of calcium ions that you could have saved, and then what you could have done is you could have released calcium again just to this height where you get the maximum recruitment of NFAT, and then what you'd have got is another spike in NFAT, so the overall activity that you'd have got from NFAT would have been greater if you'd released the calcium ions like this. Okay, so that's the basic concept, that it's not better to release all the calcium at once. Instead, it's better to release it in chunks. Now, the next question is, uh, what, what time interval should we have between these two peaks, basically? What time uh, should we leave between the two spikes? And uh, to be honest, uh, the, in this case, you're sort of wondering, like, well, what's, what's the best... Uh, way to take the interval between these two spikes, but in reality, it would these calcium spikes would look kind of like this. So it wouldn't be as ambiguous as to whether you um, picked this point as the end of that calcium spike uh, and this point as the start of that calcium spike. In this case, it's obviously less um, of a issue, basically. Okay, uh, and it would look more like this. Right. So what's the optimal? Uh, time interval to leave between calcium spikes. Well, basically, if you want to um, get the maximum effect that you want, it, it basically, um, how am I going to say this? If you want to ha let your calcium ions do the maximum work possible, then you want, uh, by the time you re-release uh, calcium again, you want all of the NFAT molecules to have gone back into the inactive state because basically, if I draw this out, let's show, let's say, um, let's say we originally have our NFAT molecules here. So these are our NFAT molecules that are currently inactivated because they have the phosphate group on. So basically, uh, when we raise calcium, that's going to activate calcineurin, and these phosphate groups are going to be removed from the NFAT, and then these NFAT molecules are going to be active. Now. How long do these phosphate groups remain, remain off of the NFAT? How long does it retake for um, the uh, phosphate groups to be re-added on? Because is there any point of using your calcium again if the NFAT molecule is still dephosphorylated, i.e. if it hasn't yet had its phosphate groups put back on, i.e. it hasn't yet been inactivated, there is absolutely no point of wasting more calcium, is there? So, if you wanted to get the maximum work for the amount of calcium you're adding, you want to wait, basically, until all the NFAT molecules have been returned to the inactive state, i.e. they've got this phosphate group added back on. Now, that dictates how long you should wait uh, before having another calcium spike, basically. So, we've worked out what the best height of the calcium spike would be. It's the one which recruits all of the NFAT molecules, and it's the lowest such concentration that recruits all the NFAT molecules. Now, we're working out what the optimal time difference is, and basically, it's the time interval um, 
that it takes for all the m fat molecules to be rephosphorylated and inactivated, basically, because you don't want to waste your calcium. Um, you don't want to give your calcium when most of the m fat molecules are still active anyway, because that's a total waste. They're inactive anyway, so you don't want to waste your calcium trying to reactivate them because it's not going to work because they're already activated. Okay, and basically, in the case of m fat, um, the uh, active transcription factor is inactivated very quickly, i.e. it's rephosphorylated very quickly, and it only takes about two minutes for all of the N-fat molecules to be rephosphorylated, basically. So, this optimal time interval between calcium spikes uh, would be around two minutes. So, if you wanted to get the maximum work out of your calcium ions possible, this is how you would do it. You would release a burst of calcium into the cytoplasm so that, um, so that all of the N fat molecules are going to be recruited, and that's the lowest possible concentration of calcium you could have used to recruit all the N fat molecules, um, basically. Okay, and then you will wait two minutes for all of the N fat molecules to then be rephosphorylated and inactivated, and then you will release the burst of calcium again, recruit all the N-fat molecules back into the active state, and you'll continue that process until you've used up all your calcium, or in this case, until you've uncaged all your IP3, which is the way this experiment is actually done. Okay, right, now let's have a look at uh, it for the case of nuclear factor kappa B. Okay, so the exact same principle holds for NF kappa B, i.e. we don't want to release all our calcium in one go, because, basically, there is a certain number of NF-kappa-B molecules in the cytoplasm of the cell, and once you've recruited all of those, once you've activated them all, then there isn't any point on putting more calcium into the cell, because it's not going to give you any more downstream effect than if you haven't bothered, basically. So, again, you want to release the amount of calcium, uh, you want to release, um, an amount of calcium that will recruit absolutely all of the NFK, uh, NF-kappa B molecules, and it, which is the least amount of calcium that you could have possibly used to achieve that effect, basically. Okay, and again, if we're thinking about what, how long should we wait between calcium spikes, then we want to look at how long does it take for these NF-kappa B molecules to be inactivated after we've activated them, basically. And if we want to think about that, then we need to look again at the way that NF-kappa B was activated. Okay, so basically, when NFK was NF-kappa B was in the um, inactive state, it was bound to this inhibitor of kappa B here, okay? And in order to um, activate NF-kappa B, what we did was we phosphorylated this inhibitor of kappa B, so we added a phosphate group onto it, and that meant that the NF-kappa B was now free to go, because the, once the inhibitor of kappa B has got a phosphate group bound to it, it can no longer bind to the uh, nuclear factor kappa B, okay? Right. Now, Basically, we saw that the inhibitor of kappa B, having this phosphate group attached to it, is really the, um, it's, uh, the death sentence for this inhibitor of kappa B, because basically what happens is then ubiquitinated, so it has a ubiquitin group put on it, like so, and then it goes for proteasomal destruction. So it gets destroyed. So, if you want to reverse the activation of NF-kappa B, what you have to do is resynthesize inhibitor of kappa B, basically. So, you need to resynthesize the inhibitor of kappa B, and therefore, once you have activated NF-kappa B, it's going to take a long time to inactivate it again, because you have to resynthesize a protein in order to inactivate it. You have to resynthesize this inhibitor of kappa B, and that takes time. So, uh, if you want to wait until all of the NF-kappa B has been inhibited again before you deliver your next calcium spike, and that's the way to get the maximum effect for the amount of calcium you're delivering, then you need to wait until all of the NF-kappa B has been re-inhibited, and that time, the time it takes for that to happen, is basically around 30 minutes. Okay, and that's because you have to re-synthesize it. So I hope what I have conveyed there for you is an understanding of why 
um, why it takes so much more long, so much longer to in inhibit, inactivate the nucleophilic factor kappa B compared to uh, the um, nucleophilic factor of activated T cells, and also why if you wanted to uh, get a maximum amount of effect for delivering a certain amount of calcium, you would have much slower calcium oscillations uh, for NF-kappa B, i.e. a much longer time interval between calcium spikes uh, for activating the nuclear factor kappa B than you would for the nuclear factor of activated T cells, which has this inactivation process that is very quick, because all you have to do is add phosphate groups back onto it, rather than resynthesize a whole protein.